Hello Book 2. All right, we're going to continue with this library tour. We're on the uh, the Annex bookcase, which is 2019 releases that I'm not quite ready yet to release into the wild, so they, they have a bookcase of their own before they get disseminated into the collection, although some of them have. Uh, and we're getting towards the end. We're, we're eventually getting towards the end. Uh, so we'll just do this next shelf. We'll do one shelf at a time. Uh, this first one is, these are all going to be things that if you've been watching this channel interminably, if you're one of the handful of people who watches every video, uh, I have a shadow on my face, would that be better? No, no, neither one is better. Uh, you will have seen all these books before, or most of them. Uh, so this first one is from the University of Chicago Press, this is Reaction Books, uh, and this is Food on the Move, a big, wonderfully illustrated uh, picture about the lost world of... Uh, rail car dining <laughs> uh, that uh, you if you've had rail car food uh, on for instance American trains anytime recently then you know that world is mostly lost <laughs> it's mostly gone uh, it was delightful just delightful uh, okay this next one is uh, uh, Archie comics <laughs> uh, is the line was invigorated a while ago with a great deal of playfulness along the same lines as the TV show Riverdale, where it's not just a straight, you know, homage to the old style Archie comics. Instead, it blends genres and it, it gets all sort of pushes all sorts of boundaries. A lot of old time Archie fans don't like it, but fortunately there aren't many of them left, actuarially speaking, and I love it. Uh, and I have been a fan of their comics as well. And this one, uh, the revamped Archie comics, uh, there's also a revamped Batman comic for DC that is Batman from 1966. It's the Adam West Batman. Uh, and this is a, a graphic novel in which they team up, <laughs> in which the, in which Batman 66 and Archie team up. And it's hilarious. The Batman 66 is just regularly hilarious anyway, but this it's hilarious. Uh, okay, we, uh, this is from uh, a small press, I think. Uh, Perseverance Press. Uh, this is a murder mystery, State University of Murder, uh, an academic murder mystery that uh, you know takes place on on a college campus that I really liked. I liked it enough to keep it when I almost never keep murder mysteries. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, this is a graphic novel of Lois Lowry's The Giver, uh, and. You know, I have a copy of The Giver, and I, I made it, I've made it clear that I prefer the movie version. Anyway, uh, the reason that I have this is because it is drawn by P. Craig Russell. And those of you who know comic books will know that he is a legend in the comic book world. What he's doing drawing a graphic novel of The Giver, I have no idea. Uh, but I, I couldn't miss it. Absolutely couldn't miss it. Uh, even though this is, a, this is P. Craig Russell trying something different. He is, this is a very, uh, very staid and... Uh, almost static uh, version of his art. I, I don't I don't care either way. I think he's a genius. Uh, okay, this one, uh, this was from um, uh, just a little while ago. I think this was from the spring. This is by Tim D. and it's called Landfill, which starts out as him doing a, a kind of a train-watching observational natural history about gulls at a landfill. And what they grab and what they don't grab and how they behave and what what protocols might be involved but it extends from there very believably to a bigger meditation on the the world that we are making wild animals live in and how they're adapting to it. it's not just gulls of course some of you will know that it's also bears uh, who are living on landfills they're living on garbage dumps because their own natural biome has been so stripped that if they didn't they would they would die out uh, but it, it, I, it was fascinating. I have a bit of a sweet spot for books about seagulls. I don't know why, because I can't stand them in person. <laughs> I just can't stand them in person. I think it might be that my love affair with books about seagulls started at the same place that a whole bunch of others did with a book called Gulls, uh, Divorce Among the Gulls uh, from, God, that must be 50 years ago. And it was so good that I, I now want to recapture that. And Landfill kind of did. Uh, okay, this next one is by Adam Makos. Uh, and this is called Spearhead. I think I've mentioned it on this, on this channel before. It's an amazing micro-study of a, one group of soldiers during the Battle of the Bulge, and it, it is written like no other World War II history that I've ever read. Uh, but like every World War II historical novel that I've ever read, <laughs> and yet it's scrupulously documented. It's just, it, may, it makes me wonder. The, uh, the author obviously made a clear decision at some point in his writing room. He obviously thought, 
well, I can either write this the way I have read it written, or I can write it in a completely different way. Emphasis on the dramatics, emphasis on the narrative, emphasis on the, you know, for want of a better word, the plot. And he obviously decided to do it that second way, and it works wonderfully. It's just a, it, it's, it'll be unlike most um, so-called regimental World War II histories that you'll ever have read. I've noticed that authors do it a little more often with World War I, and I'm wondering if that isn't just a matter of the passage of time. Uh, we shall see. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Uh, this is a reprint of uh, Brothers Keepers by the great Donald Westlake uh, the, from Hard Case Crime. I just, if anybody reprints Donald Westlake, then I snap him up. <laughs> he is he is a neglected, wonderful author. And if you ever see one of his old paperbacks at a yard sale or whatever, you're in for a treat. Just grab it and read it. You'll be very glad you did. <laughs> uh, and this next one is... Uh, this was from March. This is Fall Back Down When I Die uh, by Joe Wilkins. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a novel, it's an example of what I often call hick lit. Um, and I often use that word uh, sort of derisively because many authors of hick lit think that if they set their book in drug-addled Appalachia or, you know, in hard scrabble Kentucky or wherever, uh, that if their setting is that you use you know, rocks to wash your clothes, or the you know you live in a holler and you don't have any electricity and you never have, or stuff like that. Uh, that you don't have to do any more work than that. <laughs> the, the reason I use that I coined the phrase originally, and the reason why I sometimes use it with scorn is because sometimes authors think that way or seem to. Uh, and this didn't, this didn't at all. And it, you reliably will get four or five examples of Hicklet from the major authors in any given from the major uh, publishing houses in any given publishing year. And uh, every once in a while, one of those four or five will take it seriously, where it is a wonderfully evoked background, but it isn't expected to do any dramatic work. You have to do that. Uh, and this did that. So uh, I don't think I ever got a copy of it in hardcover. Uh, oh my, look at that. All right, we go from thin to very thick. <laughs> this is Prior of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon, a gigantic fantasy novel from the beginning of the year that I thought was spectacularly good. Just spectacularly good. Loved it right from the beginning. Unlike um, uh, Black Leopard, Red Wolf uh, by Marlon James, where the other, the year's other truly impressive fantasy epic, where I didn't love it at first. I didn't know what to make of it at first. It had to grow on me. This thing I loved right from the beginning. So, uh, and and also, you know, props to the cover design. That is that is pretty pretty darn gorgeous. Uh, and this next one, this next one has no nothing on the spine. Oh right, okay, because this is the aforementioned Crouching Dragon, Hidden Tiger. This is this is the advanced copy of uh, of Marlon James's uh, book, only in this uh, plush velour slipcase. Which uh, see, there's the book, and I I I uh, said at the time, and I still maintain that I wish the book had come this way <laughs> instead of just the advanced copy. Uh, okay, this next one is a thriller. This is Lars Kepler. This is Stalker, uh, and it, the, the advanced copy that I kept came with police caution tape on it. <laughs> so I had I had another advanced copy that didn't have the caution tape, and I also got the finished copy, so I didnn't bother to break the tape on this one. I just kept it. That's just too much fun. And it's it's a, a you know a, a crime thriller, a serial killer thriller, but so good, so good. E, it, just in terms of getting your pulse racing, it has the same problems that most other thrillers have. Uh, lots of let's just call them improbabilities <laughs> you know, let's just call them let's just say that they're, they're unlikely to happen the way the author has them happen the author has them happen the way they do in order to increase the drama in a literary novel in a literary thriller but things in real life don't aren't part of thrillers and they don't act that way like for instance uh, I believe it's in this book but if it's not it's certainly in every one of them uh, the the inevitable scene from the point of view of the person who's about to be murdered they see the killer they know who the killer is but they don't think the killer's name because not because they're frightened or because they're you know surprised or anything like that they don't think the killer's name because if they did there would be no book so they are characters in a book they are i mean obviously you say yes of course they're characters in a book it's a book you're reading it but i prefer it in fiction when the characters in the book 
don't know their characters in a book, where they aren't consciously being made to help the book. I prefer it if the writer instead writes a book around them and makes and finds the story that way, instead of just grossly manipulating things. So, you know, in this particular book, if I remember it correctly, uh, a large chunk of the of the weight of the drama is that we don't, for a while, know who the killer is, and. The, one of the first scenes that we get, if I again, if I'm remembering, if I'm not confusing this book with some other thriller, but they all do it. You've all seen it. Uh, at the beginning of the book, the victim sees the killer clearly advancing towards her and does not think his name. She knows his name, but she doesn't think his name because we can't know his name. But <laughs> anyway, uh, this next one is also a thriller. Uh, this is by Nicholas Not Ock Dog Ock Dog. Night and Day, Nicholas Night and Day. Uh, if you believe that's his real name, then I have a bridge in Brooklyn to show. Uh, but this is The Wolf and the Watchman, a historical murder mystery. This is one advanced copy, and then I got another advanced copy uh, that, that looks different. I kept them both, and I don't know why. Uh, I, I kept them both, I guess, because they do look different. But uh, I did enjoy the book, though. I'm not enough to have two copies, but, but I did enjoy the book. I thought it was really well done. Uh, Okay, this next one is uh, an expanded version, and it was expanded only once, but it could be expanded to three times its size right now. Uh, this is by um, Bandy Lee, and it is The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, where the author interviews dozens of psychologists and psychotherapists who, who, and shows them long stretches of tape. They, of course, none of these people have ever examined Donald Trump. Donald Trump would never allow himself to be examined by a psychiatrist any more than he would allow himself to be examined by a doctor. And you might say, well, isn't it, isn't it custom for the U.S. president to have an official physical once every year uh, by a hand-picked doctor? Yes, it is. And the hand-picked doctor lied away his reputation that he ought to lose all of his clients in personal life because of it, because he said that the, the president was some absurd thing like 220 pounds. The president is well, oh, he's well over 300 pounds. And also the, the, this doctor said that, that Donald Trump is six foot three. So, so, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. At nowhere in the Hippocratic Oath are you told that you cannot lie. And this author lied his face off. And he lied his face off in easily visually documentable things. So. Why he has any patience, I don't know, but and why we put any stake by an official White House physical if that's what it's going to be. Donald Trump never even took his coat off for that physical, so his blood pressure was not taken, his heart rate was not measured, nothing like that was done. Though he he dictated what to do with those numbers, uh, so he would never sit for a psychiatrist exam. And the uh, something called the Goldwater Rule in America has sort of <clears throat> largely informally prohibited psychiatrists from practicing their art from a distance uh, but as many many psychiatrists since 2016 have pointed out it is entirely possible to make all kinds of very valid diagnosis of someone of someone's mental state from a distance <laughs> since mental states are if you're not being explicitly told to lie like the US physician was uh, then it's easy to point out you know it, it, it wouldn't as many psychiatrists in this book point out if you couldn't do that if you needed an EKG for every single diagnosis, we'd all be in a pretty, a pretty tight spot. It's pretty easy to point out severe psychological problems have tells. They have easily visible tells. They don't vary from case to case, and, and uh, Donald Trump has a whole slew of them. So the, that, that's what this book is. It's an expanded version. I, somewhere here, I have the original version, and I'm sure there will be another one. Why wouldn't there be? This is from two years ago. Uh, before 80 million unhinged rants, before 80 million easily documentable lies, <clears throat> telling 9-11 survivors and their relatives and their grieving widows that he was also a 9-11 first responder, telling crowds of people that he was down there at Ground Zero shifting rubble <laughs> when he wasn't, <laughs> when he wasn't, telling people that he lost lots and lots of friends that day when he didn't. He absolutely didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, this next one is another Trump book, but I, I promise they aren't all Trump books. Uh, this is Michael Nelson's Trump the First Two Years, which was his attempt. This was, I think this came out as a paperback. This was his attempt to step back from 
the rancor that I obviously feel, although I, I also can step back. I have long practice in stepping back from rancor with horrible presidents and horrible people. <laughs> I started, I cut my teeth doing that with the only president who was ever arguably worse than Trump. Uh, uh, this is an attempt on the author's part to step back and look at the first two years of the Trump administration. What are they? What happened? And try and ignore the the psychopathology, the psychopathology, the noise. Try to ignore that and just do that. Uh, and it does a, a fairly good job. My objection to it was that it that is not uh, history. The, the, the standard thing that, that historians and presidential scholars say when they try to do something like that is, look, let's take a historical viewpoint here. Let's not get mired down in the tweet of the day. Uh, and my response to them is always, well, okay, that's an exercise that you can do. It's an intellectual exercise, but it's not historical. The psychopathology is part of the history. So cutting that out is creating a, a fantasy land Donald Trump, a fantasy land Trump president, presidency, an, an administration that doesn't exist. This administration is largely driven by psychopathologies like race, hatred, and sexism. To take that out is to make it something that it fundamentally isn't. So I, I found it interesting as a book, but the approach, <laughs> no, not so much. <laughs> okay, uh, this is uh, David Enya, some notes on a shipwreck, uh, nonfiction about uh, refugee crises and, and their human elements. Very, very good, very good, very well translated. Uh, who was the translator on this thing? Uh, do we know? Translated from the Italian by Anthony Shugar. We see him a lot. He, he translates a lot of Italian. And this author uh, wrote a novel called uh, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, I believe. Uh, translated that way. Uh, uh, well, okay, for some reason it's not, it's not listed in his author bio. Maybe this came out. <clears throat> uh, On Earth As It Is In Heaven, yes, from 2014, uh, which I loved. I thought it was fantastic. And I love this too, even though it wasn't, uh, it was a completely different, a complete change of pace. Uh, okay, all right, this is, I don't know what this is doing on the, the Annex bookcase, actually. Uh, I'm not going to write about it, and it, it, I know exactly where it belongs, and I know I'm going to keep it. So uh, <clears throat> this is Philip Caputo's A Rumor of War in a new edition, uh, with Kevin Powers' introduction and, uh, you know, just a new paperback. Uh, it's, it's a classic. If you, if you haven't read it, you should. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't belong here, <clears throat> because... There's no doubt. This, this, the Annex bookcase is largely a place of doubt. Despite the fact that I'm praising all of these books, it's still a question of doubt. Do I want to keep this thing? It's a major thing for me now to keep a book in my personal collection forever because that collection is too big. <laughs> uh, so this is, you know, although I love these books and want to keep them obviously for a while, there's an element, the element of doubt is what underscores this whole bookcase. And there is no doubt of a rumor of war. Of course, I want a copy. And this one was sent to me and I didn't have one. So... Uh, but anyway, let's uh, let's just move on. Okay, this is by Nathaniel Farrell Brody. This is uh, Steel on Stone. Very, very good history of people who, over time, have worked in uh, in Grand Canyon, uh, and just uh, yeah, the author spent a season uh, in the Grand Canyon working with the National Parks crew, got all their stories, got what it's like to to work there under those conditions in the summer. That can be pretty brutal but also in the winter, uh, and also learned a lot of the history of, of that. And I, I, uh, I have been to the Grand Canyon many, many times, and I, and I never even thought of that aspect of it. So, uh, so I kept it, but again, doubt is the active thing. I don't know if I'm gonna keep that for forever, and I don't know where it's gonna be. Uh, okay, all right. All right, well, we'll end with a Trump book. So we had, we had a greater number of Trump books here than I thought I kept, because uh, I have read them all in 2019. I haven't missed any, but I haven't kept them. <laughs> that would be just, that would be adding insult to injury. <laughs> uh, but I did keep this one. This is the paperback. It's an updated paperback and, uh, you know, it has an extra chapter or two and extra notes. So I got rid of the hardcover and just kept the paperback. This is Rick Wilson's Everything Trump Touches Dies with a tiny hand on the cover. Uh, and you have seen, if you watch uh, cable news punditry, uh, on CNN or MSNBC, you will have seen Rick Wilson. He is, they often bring him in to give commentary. I strongly advise you uh, to take the approach that I took, <laughs> take the approach that I've taken so far in 2019. It has meant a big difference to me, to my mental health. I strongly advise you just not to watch punditry. Uh, 
just don't do it. Just cut it all out of your diet. In fact, don't watch any live action news of any kind and disable all the news feeds from Facebook and Twitter. Just read a paper uh, or, or find a, a reflection blog of some kind, a, a political blog that reflects on the events of the previous day or the previous week with the emphasis on the word reflect rather than hot take. Get all the hot takes out of your news feed. Get them out of your life. All they are doing is corroding you. They raise your blood pressure. They make you angry. They make you despairing and without any purpose, without any end goal. It's just that. It's just you're introducing a negative into your life. So I don't see Rick Wilson anymore. I don't hear his takes on the Mueller testimony or anything like that. I'm sure that he gives them on five different channels, but I don't hear them anymore. But I read his book. His book is very much a written version of those hot takes. Uh, the, this is the polar opposite of, for instance, uh, the case for Trump. This is, this is uh, you know, the title pretty much says it all, but the, the book goes on. It's just an, an, a long screed about how Donald Trump is the quintessence of evil. Um, and Rick Wilson can write, so I think that might be a, a part of why I kept this book as opposed to all the others. But I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping within the next shelf, we won't have just constant Trump books. We'll see. I'm hoping not. I don't think I kept that many of them. Of course, I kept Bob Woodward's book, Fear. Uh, and of, of course, because Fear sold so incredibly well, uh, he has been approached several times for a sequel. Uh, and that's going to be hard to do, just like it was in Michael Wolff's case, because uh, Michael Wolff had access to the White House. He wrote Fire and Fury. It was a huge bestseller, and access was cut off, completely cut off. Uh, and I have a feeling that, that, uh, that I mean, Bob Woodward never was granted that kind of access. He's a real reporter. He, he, he developed sources on his own. But I have a feeling that those sources have been threatened uh, now, by now, to, uh, to, under no circumstances, speak to anyone, especially Bob Woodward. And, you know, it's not the damning revelations in fear that bothered Trump. He can't read. He's not able to read. People say, when you say that, you mean he's not a big reader. No, he doesn't know how to read. He doesn't, he doesn't know how to read English. Uh, but he, he has had many cartoon breakdowns of that book. And the thing that bothers him about it is not that he comes off as a psychopathic liar all throughout. It, that doesn't bother him. How could it? He knows he is one. Now, the thing that bothers him about it is how much money it made. And so I'm pretty sure he has clamped down completely on anything like that happening again. I suppose Woodward could still cultivate outside sources, but they'd be guessing what goes on in the Oval Office. They'd be guessing what goes on in the Situation Room. Uh, not hard to guess that, but, but even so, I don't know that we'll see a sequel. I don't think there'll be many more big Trump books this year, uh, but we shall see. Uh, but not in this, <laughs> we shall see on this channel, but not on this library tour. This library tour will go on to the next shelf. I'm gonna have to go up with a different angle because the next shelf is well down there. <laughs> but uh, I don't think there are any Trump books on that, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> but anyway, I'm gonna wrap this up for now, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.